thank you, Anna and Juanke, um, for inviting me. It's um, it's really a pleasure to be here. To um, I feel like um, everybody I talk to, like I feel like everybody's scientific cousin here. Like <laughs> I, uh, what I will tell you today focuses on intracellular ion channels and. Um, this is an evolving story. I will tell you some of the things that um, we found so far and some of the questions that we um, discovered in the process, some of the questions that um, came up in the process. And um, these are the ion channels that give the color to our skin, but as you'll see, they are relevant for many other processes. So we are interested in pigmentation, but we are also interested in using melanocytes and neural crest-derived um, cell type to study uh, as a model system for other um, channels in the ion channels in the body. So um, I will focus today on pigment cells, and uh, pigment cells are found primarily in two places in the body, in the skin, and this is human epidermal skin. Like, uh, this is the epidermis, the outermost layer of our skin, and it um, consists of melanocytes. These are the neural crest-derived cells that are on the basal layer of the epidermis. And one thing that is important to remember is that these cells are only in the human epidermis. Humans are among the very few mammals that have um, epidermal melanocytes, um, which is great for us, but for science, it's not such a good thing because we don't have mouse models. Uh, surrounding the melanocytes are the keratinocytes. Overall, it's about 40 to 1 ratio. These are um, polarized cells that migrate in the Z direction as they differentiate and they form um, the outer layer that insulates the inside of the body from outside. The human epidermal skin is constantly exposed to light and um, among the solar, U solar radiation, it's the ultraviolet that has the most impact on our skin. In addition to the skin, um, there are pigment cells in two places in the eye. First of all, first of all it's retinal pigmented epithelium. These are cells that contain a lot of pigment, but they are of a different, they are of a different origin. They are not neural crest derived. And in addition, there is the choroid right here that has melanocytes that are very close. Uh, closely related to these melanocytes, but both of these have uh, pigment. They're cells that have pigment. And the function of the choroidal cells or iris melanocytes is um, entirely unknown. The retinal pigmented epithelium is what regenerates the chromophore for the photoreceptor, so their function is uh, more studied, but it's not clear why they need the pigment. Um, what happens when the cells don't work? Uh, because they're expressed in skin and the eye, um, the disease is called oculocutaneous albinism and it affects the skin and the eye. What is important uh, to remember is that these people have very complex um, vision, eye problems, and uh, they also uh, have very high um, chance of developing skin cancer. Now, in Africa, 98% of people with albinism die before the age of 40 because of a skin cancer, because they're, they don't have as much uh, sunscreen and ways to protect themselves. But in the um, developed countries, in the Western countries, the main problem is the vision, and these people are all legally blind. Their vision is greatly affected. So um, how do these cells make melanin? How do they make pigment? This, uh, if, if this is a melanocyte, the melanocyte has these organelles that are lysosomal-related organelles called melanosomes. And the way they make 
um, melanin is using primarily using this enzyme that is a tyrosine hydroxylase. Um, melanin is a derivative of tyrosine and L-DOPA is an intermediate of um, melanin. So this is the same, it's a close relative of the tyrosine hydroxylase that is involved in dopamine production in the dopaminergic neurons. But this one is membrane bound and its catalytic domain is inside this organelles. So this is, uses tyrosine uh, to generate melanin via L-DOPA. Um, so what are the melanosomes? Melanosomes are lysosomal-like organelles. They are derived just like lysosomes from endosomes. Um, there is one important difference between them and that is their pH. While lysosomes, as you all know, are highly acidic, the melanosomes have almost neutral pH. Well, this is a little strange because they both use the same vesicular ATPase to regulate their pH. So how can one have a much higher pH than the other one? Um, not only that it, this is not uh, by coincidence, but it turns out that the tyrosinase is a pH dependent enzyme and um, it does not work if the pH is low. It only works at almost neutral pHs. So it's really important for their function to have the pH almost neutral. Now, melanosomes go through different um, stages and um, as they develop, this is an electron micrograph of stage two, three, and four. Stage one looks round just like lysosomes and um, they, have, they have this uh, layers, they have more and more melanin as, as they develop. So what is important for the rest of my talk is to remember that tyrosinase is the main mel melanogenic enzyme and also that it requires a neutral pH. Um, now we wanted to know how exactly what causes albinism and there was a review a few years ago and I decided to take the genes responsible for different forms of albinism there are seven oculocutaneous albinism genes, um, not genes, uh, types so far, and I'm sure there are other orphan uh, ones. Um, of those for OCA5, the gene is not identified. Um, this one is an unknown, pretty much all of them except for one and three are unknown function proteins. So, um, much to my surprise, when I uh, mapped all these genes to melanocytes, they all are in the, they all seem to be in the melanosomal membrane. So this is the tyrosinase. Mutations cause oculocutaneous albinus type 1. This is a tyrosinase related protein. Um, it's thought to support the function of tyrosinase. Again, not sure exactly what it does but mutations cause OCA3. Now, OCA2, it's caused by this 12th transmembrane protein that it's known to be in melanosomes. There is um, another unknown function transporter, LC, SLC45A2, that mutations in which cause OCA4. And um, this one is an odd relative of NCKX family with unknown function and localization. I mean, it's in melanosomes, but it seems to be in um, other organelles as well. So what um, we thought is that the, the milieu of these melanosomes must be important because if you disrupt this channels or transporters, you cannot make melanin. So there must have an, some kind of a role in regulated, the, the milieu must be tightly regulated. So um, I know you all know that and I'm uh, that, you know, the ion channels are important, but when we started on this project, we realized that they're actually, in addition to the channels and receptors that are at the membrane, that lead to cellular responses, that is uh, what we've been studying for a long time. 
there are actually ion channels and transporters in all these different organelles in the cells that they also can lead to cellular responses, sometimes fast cellular responses, um, similar to the one um, on the plasma membrane. Well, um, these are a lot more challenging to study because, um, as you're saying, it's hard enough to patch a cell. Imagine this tiny organelle. Um, however, this has um, been done before. So um, one method that people um, did before was to isolate organelles and then to patch the isolated organelles. This is the case for mitochondria. This is, um, we are just talking about Yuri Kirikok in 2004. He, this is how he identified um, the calcium uniporter and characterized the, the channel. Um, another, another possible, um, the same method was used for lysosomes. That's another, so you see, like if you can patch a mitochondria or lysosome, pretty much you're gonna have a nature paper. Uh, this is a little, um, 2008, and this is how CLC7 was um, identified in uh, liver lysosome, uh, lysosomes isolated for, from liver. Well, more recently, um, another method was published, and that is the patch clamp organelles that are attached to the cell. Um, how was that possible? That was possible with vacuolin, which is a chemical that enlarges lysosomes. So once people figure out that you treat cells with vacuolin, that enlarges lysosomes, and now from 100 nanometers, you are around one to three microns if you're lucky, okay? So um, this is the first paper published with this, uh, with this technique. And there were um, maybe like six, seven years when everybody ignored this paper. Um, well, I don't want to uh, say we were pioneers because there are people who uh, looked at lysosomal ion channels, but we got the idea if they can patch lysosomes, maybe we can patch melanosomes. Um, and uh, well, I wouldn't be telling you the story if we couldn't patch them. This is a melanocyte, and these are the melanosomes inside, and this is a melanosome in the patch pipette. So um, we started with OCA2, and um, again, I wouldn't be telling you the story if it wasn't for an amazing graduate student in the lab who actually liked the challenges, technical, scientific, any kind of challenge, and he was incredibly perseverant and resilient in patching those. So the OCA2 the P protein was identified as a naturally occurring mutation in mouse. Um, this is, uh, was cloned in 93. This is its predicted structure. It's 12 transmembrane domain N and C cytosolic and um, the all a bunch of uh, melanosomal loops is almost exclusively expressed in the retina and in the skin. Uh, retina where you have RP and choroid and the skin looks like low level but in fact when you look at melanocytes it's, it's absent from keratinocytes and fibroblasts only present in melanocytes. Um, so uh, Nick Bellono is the superstar who did the melanosomal recordings and I think it really paid off for him. Uh, not only it built character in terms of patience and resilience, but he is an assistant professor at Harvard um, um, in nearby. So um, what we did, we took OCA2 and put GFP on its C-terminus, and we took advantage of the fact that melanosomal protein are localized to lysosomes in non-pigmented cells. Um, and lysosomes, as I told you, can be enlarged with vacuolin. So when we express them in 293 cells, this is the bright field, 
I know it's hard to believe the cells are alive, but they are alive. This is how OCA2GFP looks like, um, and you see all these enlarged lysosomes. So what Nick did was he um, looked at, with one pipette, he put the cells were attached to the glass, and he used the pipette to do like microsurgery to cut a little slit in the membrane. And then with another pipette, he would push um, the, the enlarged lysosome just out of this part of the membrane, out of the slit, and right away he would exchange with the memory um, manipulator, he would exchange the pipette with a clean pipette and come back to the same position and, um, and patch the um, lysosome. Now you realize that this sounds a lot easier than, um, it's a lot easier to describe it than to do it. Um, this is an example of a cell that contains both a lysosomal marker and also OCA2GFP. What, um, one thing to mention before I show you the recordings is that in the case of an organelle, the current conventions are different. So if this is the IV, then the inward current is um, by convention, it's either positive ions going out or negative ions going in, right? The opposite of plasma membrane. The outward current, obviously, it's the opposite. So um, here are the recordings from lysosomes. When uh, we apply a step protocol, there is nothing in the mock transfected cells, uh, but there is a significant current when we express OCA2GFP. And we see the same thing when we apply a ramp. Uh, this is the background current and this is the OCA2, the current that appears when uh, the cells have OCA2. Now, um, I should tell you that the recording solutions here um, are what can, that by changing the uh, recording solution, this is how we can control the positive and negative ions, uh, ion flux. So this is an outward current. That means that either positive ions are going into the melanosome or negative ions are going out. So uh, given the solutions that we had, it's either potassium going in or chloride going out. These were the only two ions we had. Um, I'm not going to show you, but if you take away potassium, nothing changes. If you take away chloride, the current disappears. Therefore, um, therefore, this must be chloride going out of melanosome. Now, this is a little, um, was a little confusing at the beginning because the OCA2 does not look anything like a chloride channel, like any of the um, known chloride channel uh, classes. So if it is indeed a channel, but at this point we cannot say for sure it's a channel. If it is indeed a channel, it must form a class of its own. Um, those, were, those were the lysosomes that could be enlarged with vacuolin. Now the question is, how about the melanosomes? So we came back, let's try to enlarge the melanosomes. Well, the bad news were that melanosomes are not enlarged. Um, by vacuolin. So that was kind of a bummer. But um, the good news is that we found a mouse model. This is ocular albinus type 1. It's a GPCR knockout. And in this mouse model, the melanosomes are enlarged. So um, this was um, what we decided to use. And this is um, the image seems a little pixelated here, but um, this is a OA1 mouse melanocyte in culture, and this is one of these giant melanosomes. Um, what do we see when we look at the melanosomes? Do we see a similar current? Um, we looked at the dermal melanosomes, and um, we also dissected bullfrog eyes because they have the biggest RPE cells and uh, RPE melanosomes, 
And uh, Nick also patched an RPE melanosome from bullfrog eyes. And using similar solutions with high chloride inside, um, he saw the same current uh, for both melanocytes. Now, if we replace the chloride with gluconate, the current disappears. Um, this, is, this is the current that you can see that both the reversal potential and the current density is very similar in both cases. And it's also similar to the one measured in hex cells, suggesting that this is um, the same channel. Now, um, we submitted the, the paper um, to, to review, and the reviewer said, well, we're not, we didn't say this is a new class of channels, but the reviewer said, well, we don't believe you. What if, and I'm sure you're thinking that what if this is a chaperone that brings a chloride channel to the melanosome? So um, that uh, pushed us to try to do single channel currents that seemed at the beginning mission impossible, but um, apparently not for Nick. <laughs> so what we did was we took the organelle and he took a little patch out of that. And this is a lysosome. So this is a hex cell that expresses OCA2. And you see these are steps between minus 80 and 80. You see the single, cha single channel current. And the same thing happened. Um, the same thing happened in dermal melanosomes. In this patch, there are two channels. So they're open one and open two state, but it looks very similar. One question that now we are able to answer is, is this a channel or a transporter? And um, um, I think some of you at least must know that the difference, one main difference between channels and transporters is that channels allow a lot of ions to go through uh, the pore. So their conductance, like we, one can calculate the number of ions per second. So the number of ions per second is much higher for channels than for transporters. Um, so having the single channel, we can calculate the conductance and it was around 60 picosiemens for the um, lysosomal expressed OCA2 and it was very close for um, the endogenous cur current for the dermal melanosome. Now, 60 picosiemens corresponds to about 5.5 time, times 10 to the 7 ions per second that definitely point in the direction of that suggests that this is a channel. Um, and again, it, um, is it a chloride channel or we just didn't try other N ions? Um, we looked at the ionic selectivity, uh, both for lysosomes, uh, dermal and eye melanosomes. And what we found is that this channel is highly selective for chloride and bromide, but um, does not allow other anions to, um, to pass. So this is a class, it's a, it's a member of a new class of chloride channels that um, intracellular chloride channels. Now, um, the question is, why do you need a chloride channel in a melanosome? Well, so I told you that there are these vesicular ATPases that all organelles have, that they pump protons in, and protons lower pH that block tyrosinase. So maybe the difference between a lysosome and the melanosome, the way melanosomes could increase their pH um, is using an anion channel. So anion channels can regulate organelle pH, and uh, this has been suggested before. And um, this could be responsible for the increased melanosomal pH. Um, I will show you in, in the summary how exactly, so the, the chloride channel allows negative charges to leave, right? Leaves the inside with an excess of positive charges. This being electrogenic will pump less protons. 
Um, so we wanted to test this hypothesis to see if OCA2 opening leads to a decrease in membrane potential and decrease activity of vesicular ATPase, which will increase the tyrosine. So this was our hypothesis. And what we did, we tested uh, using two different methods. If the pH of, if OCA2 expression changes the pH of the organelles. And uh, this is one of the methods. This is the floor in lamp one. And we apply BAF A that is a pH ionophore that basically uh, increases. This is the maximal pH. And you can see that when we express OCA2, you see um, in, in here expression of OCA2 increases the baseline pH, almost close to maximal. Now, um, I didn't um, show you that we were trying to figure out if this is a chloride channel, where is the pore? And we went to the database for albinism and we found different mutations. Uh, we, mute, we introduced the mutations in OCA2. Many of them interfered with the localization, but this one, V443i, it was localized to melanosomes, but did not have chloride conductance. Um, so you see that if there is no chloride conductance, there is no OCA2 mediated increase in pH. So this is the inactive mutant, V443i. Um, OCA2 increases the pH. And we also used um, a chemical indicator. This is lysosensor that allowed us to calibrate the pH. And you can see that it's an increase in pH from about 5.2 to like 6.7, mediated by OCA2, um, which could account for the difference that we see um, between lysosomes and melanosomes. So, um, Th These were the main experiments that led us to the conclusion that OCA2 is a melanosomal um, chloride channel. Sorry. Um, and, uh, but also made us realize that the picture is a lot more complex, um, that there might be some other channels and transporters that actually regulate uh, the melanosome. Um, so when we were recording from the cells, we also found a PIP2 activated current. Now, this is not the PIP2 that we all know um, that is uh, degraded, it, that is hydrolyzed into IP3 and diacyglycerol. This is PI35P2. In fact, we used that one as a negative control. This is the um, intracellular PIP2 that uh, no one knows exactly how it's regulated, but seems to regulate many channels. And um, this was not the OCA2 current because this current, as you can see, it's um, either negative ions going in or positive ions going out. Um, we did uh, selectivity and we found that this is a sodium current. Now, um, there is no selectivity for potassium um, or calcium. Now, um, what can it be? There are, at that time, two types of channels that were PIP2 regulated. One of them, uh, TRIPML1, which is a TRIP channel mutated in mucolipidosis, also called mucolipin, and uh, two pore channels. Luckily, they have specific activators or inhibitors, and um, the MLSA1 does nothing, so that takes TRIPML out of the picture. We're left with the two pore channels. And when we block the two pore channels, you can see that PIP2, so this is verapamil plus PIP2 does not um, activate, does not activate the current. Now, um, this is the crystal structure of two pore channel came out a few years ago. Uh, from uh, plants, and it has two pores. Uh, it has two, a tandem of uh, two six-membrane domains, and it also has two EF hands. 
Now there are two two-port TPCs. There is a two-port channel two and a two-port channel one. What we did was we made GFP, we expressed them, and I showed you first that they are present in melanosomes. So we figured whichever one goes to melanosomes, that's going to be the channel we see. Uh, TPC2, it goes mostly to melanosome. You see a lot of yellow here, but there is barely any TPC1. So this, that takes TPC1 out of the picture. Um, we're left with TPC2. Now, this was um, interesting because there, there is a, still is a controversy in the field whether TPC2, it's a calcium channel. And people think that this is a calcium release channel from lysosomes. I should tell you that TPC2, it's a lysosomal channel um, that has been shown to work in, in lysosomes. Some people think it's sodium, some people think it's calcium. Um, we see no um, calcium permeability, but because we didn't see any, we are wondering, is that really TPC2 or not? Of course, we took it out with CRISPR. Uh, the current disappears. We reconstitute with the human. The current reappears. Um, now, what happens? So these cells, now, if you change the charge balance inside, you are going to change the driving force, the membrane potential, the driving force on the VATPase. So we are wondering, does anything happen with pigmentation? Um, so this is the current density when we uh, use the TPC2 CRISPR and the rescue. And when we looked at TPC2 CRISPR, uh, the amount of melanin that uh, the this, this cells make, we saw that the cells were uh, much darker. Uh, this is the cell pellet. Now, um, I didn't show you this measurements for OCA2, but in contrast, exactly the opposite of what we see for OCA2, we see that the membrane potential, the melanosomal membrane potential in the TPC2 CRISPR cells is lower than in the control cells. Um, a few years ago, uh, there, was, um, um, th there was a genetic study that showed that this um, TPC2, two-port channel two, is associated with hair color um, and skin color in um, Icelanders. So uh, we are wondering how does that work? How does TPC2 work? And I guess that was the first obvious experiment that we are lucky enough to, um, that, that worked. So of course, pH. So membrane potential is changed driving force on the VATPase. Um, we measure the, the pH of TPC2 CRISPR cells and of the control cells. And sure enough, the TPC2 CRISPR is um, increased. So remember the OCA2 expressing uh, lysosomes, melanosome had higher pH. Here the knockdown has higher pH. So that suggests opposite directions. So um, the, the summary of those two channels is that OCA2 increases pH and pigmentation and TPC2 uh, decreases pH and pigmentation. So this is a positive regulator, TPC2 is a negative regulator. Um, the way they do it both is by changing the membrane potential in opposite directions and that changes the driving force on the vesicular ATPase that allows more or less protons to come in and that regulates the activity of tyrosinase. Well, one question that we had, and I mean, the, the rest of the slides I have are preliminary data that we're, um, we're trying, more channels that we're trying to, to put on the melanosome. So one question that we had is how does chloride get into melanosomes because you cannot just have one channel that allows chloride and a lot of chloride as I showed you to come out something has to bring chloride in. Um, the other question that we have is well tyrosinase using tyr uses tyrosine how does tyrosine get in 
Uh, it must be an amino acid transporter, and those are often coupled with ion, ion co-transport. Um, and we are also wondering what else is in there, because you know the, uh, there must be a more, um, more uh, rich ionic um, environment inside. And also for each ion, you have to have something that brings it in and something that takes it out. So um, yeah, how does chloride get into melanosome? So one of the first thoughts we had is that um, this is an ion channel, so it only goes in the direction of the gradient. And it only functions when inside the chloride concentration is higher than outside. Uh, if chloride is the same or vice versa, OCA2 is not going to open. Um, so the gradient is, it, the ion channels only go in the direction of the gradient. Therefore, to bring chloride back, we cannot use another, cannot be another ion channel because it's an ion channel and would go the same direction as OCA2. So we thought that this must be a transporter. Now there is a family of intracellular chloride transporters and these are the CLC uh, transporters and they are chloride proton exchangers. This is one of those uh, papers I showed you was done in um, lysosome, liver uh, lysosomal preparation. And one of them in particular is present in lysosomes. And this is CLC7 that has a subunit called OSTEM1. Um, a lot is known about them. Um, one thing that um, they're knockout mice, but uh, CLC7 is widely uh, expressed and it is the uh, transporter known to acidify uh, lysosomes. Um, there is a knockout mouse that importantly, interestingly, has a pigmentation defect. So um, we are wondering, does CLC, could CLC7 be what brings the chloride for OCA2? Um, this is the work of Donald who is um, a remarkable grad student in the lab. Um, we took, we had a number of SHRNAs. This is a representative, two representative ones. Um, we knock down, so what we do, we knock down CLC7, and what we see is that the cells become really dark. Um, when we measure the melanin of the cells, this is no transfection, non-targeting. This is GFP for a control. This is cells that are bleached with a tyrosinase inhibitor. So this is no melanin at all. And you see that it's almost like 10 times increase in, in melanin. So lower CLC7 is the less CLC7, the more pigmentation. Again, CLC7 is the transporter that acidifies lysosomes. So less acidification, more pigmentation. So we're going in the right direction. Um, well, around the same time we had this data, um, where is he? Oh, a, a friend um, of ours, uh, Joe Mindell at NIH, uh, told us about these two patients that came to the unidentified disease program at NIH that um, had a lysosomal storage. So because he is the CLC7 guy at NIH, um, they, he figured out the cellular mechanism. So coincidentally, two patients came. Um, they did RNA-seq for um, their uh, transcriptome. And they found a point mutation, the same point mutation in both patients. These patients were really, um, they, were, they were very sick. And the mutation, as Joe Mindell showed, um, is the Y715C. And this is a gain of function mutation that hyperacidifies the lysosomes. So these kids um, are. Uh, the kids are very sick. They cannot walk. They cannot hold down food. They're really, um, their development is, is very um, much behind their age. 
But um, one thing that we noticed when um, he showed us the data is, and you might not notice from here, is that they are both albino. Uh, this is a Caucasian kid, but the parents of this kid were uh, both from Africa and they had really dark skin. Um, they also made the mouse and the mouse is also white. The mouse model of um, um, the gain of function mutation. So um, we are wondering if CLC7 is in melanosomes, how can CLC7 regulate? So there are two possibilities. It's either in melanosomes and does what we think it's doing, um, or it's in lysosomes and somehow lysosomes talk to melanosomes, which seemed a little far-fetched. So when we looked at lysosomes, we saw, so this is GF CLC7 with the GFB, and this is OCA2. So the same melanosomes, I know if you can appreciate the pattern in this areas where you have, you can see individual puncta, um, the, same, the same puncta that have CLC, they also have OCA2. Um, we have OSTEM1, I just didn't show it because uh, this would not, doesn't localize without its subunit. Okay, this is a zoom in in, in this, um, in an area. And this is a representative image. When we calculate the overlap, we see that um, the, all the melanosomes that have OCA2, they have CLC7. The same stages, not all the melanosomes have it, only the ones that have OCA2. Well, um, does CLC7 regulate melanosomal pH? Well, that doesn't, uh, we're still in the process of, of looking with genetically encoded indicators. Doesn't, um, it's not as easy as we thought it would be, but we did some um, quick experiments with the LISO sensor. And what we see is that when we overexpress CLC7 or the gain of function mutation, the luminal pH decreases significantly, right? Now, if we overexpress OCA2, we rescue the pH defect, suggesting that they function, um, they oppose each other's function. Now, I told you uh, that uh, we are wondering, well, one question now is, you have CLC7, this is how lysosomes become acidified, and it's only in melanosomes. Like, we were worried that we're gonna see it all over. No, it's only in melanosomes. Um, how do the lysosomes of the cells function? Uh, what acidifies them? Do they have the same pH? And we're still trying to figure that out, but one step, um, uh, in, in that we think it's another CLC that it's overexpressed, but that would suggest that not all cells have the same type of melanosomes, endosomes, um, and other organelles, that there is a little bit of specialized um, protein expression in those organelles depending on the cell function. So around the same time we, we started this, we did a bigger screen um, for um, unknown function proteins at the membrane, and uh, we are testing MFSD12. This is an, another 12 membrane, uh, 12 transmembrane proteins, intracellular, predicted to be intracellular, and it's very highly expressed in melanocytes, but not, not in any of the other skin cell types. So around the same time, the Sarah Tishoff at UPenn she travels around Africa and she's a human geneticist. So she has uh, what she calls a bush lab. She takes, she has a lab and she goes to these tribes that have very different skin color um, and takes, convinces them uh, through mostly sign language to give her some, a little bit of blood and let her measure their skin color. So, um, this is, this is, she wants to identify variants. This not only will tell how the population migrated, but also give us an idea about the, the complex um, regulatory mechanism. 
So she went to Africa, she had a number of patients, and when she did uh, GWAS, she found that MFSD12, so if you remember, this is OCA6, uh, OCA2, she found MFSD12 as one of the genes that um, were present only in this population that is really, really, really dark. Um, so, okay, so we thought maybe it does something in melanosomes. Um, we published this um, with them a while ago, it was a really um, fortunate coincidence. Now, when we downregulated MFSD12, uh, as shown in here, their melanin, the melanin of the cells went up, okay? Not as much as for CLC7, but the melanin of the cells went up. Now, the really big surprise, wa surprise was when we look at MFSD12 and try to localize it with melanosomes. No colocalization. However, when we used the lysosomal marker, was a um, very high degree of localization suggesting that MFSD12 is in lysosomes and from lysosomes somehow regulates the melanin in melanosomes. Um, we're still trying to figure out how, um, together with our collaborators, how this works. And also remember that these lysosomes do not have CLC7. And, um, Maybe this compensates or maybe um, it's, it's part of um, it, it's part of the melanosomal lysosomes. One thing that uh, you need to keep in mind when you look at um, this normal patients or albinism is that um, albinism it's a screen done by nature. These are proteins that are only in melanocytes, not in other places. So um, we started doing this screen because we think there are a lot of proteins. Albinism is also a symptom, especially in neurodegenerative diseases. Um, so we think there are a lot of other proteins that if are expressed in other tissues, they cause albinism as a symptom, just like in the case of CLC7. And again, people who have MFSD variants, they're normal people. They don't have any other um, disease. And with that, um, this kind of goes. Um, I would like to summarize what I told you. Um, so one important take home message is from, from a therapeutic point of view is that changing the melanosomal pH is sufficient for modulating melanin production. Um, we just need to find a way to specifically change it, not to uh, alter lysosomes and endosomes and everything else. Um, we found OCA2 as a chloride channel that increases pH and pigmentation. We found TPC2 as a melano melanosomal sodium channel that decreases pH and pigmentation. Um, CLC7 or OSTEM1 is pending further validation, but so far it looks like it's a melanosomal exchanger that is a negative regulator of pigmentation. And now we have MFSD12, which is a lysosomal transporter ion channel, we don't know yet, that function as a negative regulator of pigmentation. So I put some lysosomes here just to complete the picture. And that raises a lot of questions, which is good because it keeps us busy. Um, does CLC7 OSTEM1 regulate both pH and chloride? Um, this is puzzling to us. How does a lysosomal um, transporter channel regulate pigmentation? Um, how do the lysosomes of these cells function? And again, we're yet to figure out how other um, intracellular channels and transporters participate in, in this process. 
And with that, I would like to acknowledge the people who did um, most of the uh, experiments I showed you. Um, our, uh, my close friend and collaborator at UPenn, Dr. Mickey Marks, also uh, Sarah Tishoff, uh, my friend and collaborator, next door neighbor, Anita Zimmerman, uh, some of the former and present people, and I would like to take any questions. <laughs>